ES Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm Rachel Abbott and this is The Leader. Today we're giving you some bonus content taken from our business show, How to Be a CEO. It's an opportunity to hear from the most powerful people behind some of the world's biggest brands. This is actually a cut down version of the full episode. To hear the full thing, you'll need to hit the link in the show notes. Find a new episode of How to Be a CEO every Monday morning. And why not give it a rate, review and follow whilst you're there. Now, let's begin. Marketing, it's an art, not a science. Who can tell what's going to be a classic line and what isn't? That's the guy who came up with Audi's Volsprung durch Technik. And by the way, the research on that said don't do it. Really? Um, yeah, they researched it because obviously they were concerned. And the research came back and said, no, don't do it. So John Haggerty has been in advertising since the 60s, the era of the Mad Men TV show. He founded Bartle, Bogle and Haggerty, who came up with some of the most influential campaigns of all time. The Levi Laundrette had, the Lynx Effect, Flat Eric, all from BBH. He's been at the top of the game throughout changes in society and technology. And in 2014, he co-founded the Garage Soho, an early stage investor and brand builder for daring entrepreneurs. Don't start a business, create a movement. So you look at Apple, the movement, you know, you look at any great product. In a sense, it was us against them. I'm David Marlson from The Evening Standard. We all know marketing's essential, but incredibly difficult. It's not just the idea, it's how do you get people to notice. In an age of ad blockers, subscriptions promising commercial free access, even skip 10 seconds buttons on your podcast player. Not that any of you would use them. We are in an age where avoiding adverts is encouraged. So when we meet John, I want to know, how do you still get your message out? Well, the first thing to say is people have always tried to skip ads. This isn't something new. You know, we, we, we always kind of talk about these things as though it suddenly happened. I mean, you know, I went into advertising. I didn't like advertising. I thought most advertising was boring, insulting, banal. The problem that we've got is that we think the solution to this is more technology, not more creativity. The problem that we have is that the industry are not responding to this need in the sense of making more intriguing, interesting, distinctive, funny ads that people want to see. It's always been about that creativity side, though, isn't it? Because technology changes and the way that we approach people change, but a good idea always breaks through. Well, exactly. I mean, the whole point about communication is it's based on an idea. Nothing happens without an idea. We've sort of got into this world because of we've been baffled by all this about AI and, you know, algorithms and all, all sound fantastic, don't they? That somehow we've dispensed with the need to have a great idea. But technology can be extremely useful. These days, advertisers potentially know a huge amount about their audiences and their individuals as well. Surely that's the sort of thing that people can use to maybe help with creativity. Technology is fundamentally important. It's the handmaiden to creativity. Data has always been there, but it's how you use the data that is crucial. And people forget that, in a way, everybody's going to have access to the data. And then what do you do? We've all got access to the data now. And in fact, if anything, you know, 20, 30 years ago, large organizations could own the data and not have other people own it. So it became hard for smaller companies to get hold of that data. Today, the data is available to everybody now. How do you use it? What are you going to do with it? That is the question I was about to ask you. How do you use it, John? <laughs> well, you use it with coming up with ideas that captivate people. But, you know, again, you know, I spent my life kind of in advertising with people saying, I've got some research that proves this and I've got research that proves that. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes up with something that nobody ever expected. And suddenly we've got something different. And people are intrigued by difference. Yet when it comes to commissioning it and doing it, we're hesitant about difference. What's the first step if you're creating a startup then and you want to get out there and you need people to see you? That's obviously one of the most important things. I've started a company. Now I have to tell everybody about it. It's a massive question. I'm, you know, People have made a lot of money out of this question. How do you do it? Where do you start? Well, the first thing you start is what's the problem you're solving? So what's your idea as a business? So what am I doing that's going to solve a problem? The second thing is create a culture around that 
that's really interesting. If you look at the great companies from the word go, they had a culture around what they believed in. It wasn't just a product. They were trying to create a movement. And then the phrase they always use in in, um, the investor world is enough runway for the product to take off. Because often great products, great ideas fail, not because they're not great products, is they just don't have enough investment to get them up off the ground. And those are the things that usually go wrong for a product. I know that there's no magic bullet for creativity, but you've worked on some extraordinary advertising campaigns, the Levi ads, for example, Volsprung mm-hmm. Technik with Audi and that kind of thing. When you put something together, do you absolutely know that's the one we're going to go with? I mean, something like that Audi tagline, that, that's completely left field, isn't it? We're, we're going to use a foreign language across all of these markets. That's definitely going to work. The research on that said, don't do it. Really? Um, Yeah, they researched it because obviously they were concerned. Um, And the research came back and said, no, don't do it. And fortunately, we had two wonderful clients at Audi at the time, Brian Bowler and Johnny Mazaris. And they said, but we are a German company. So, you know, why shouldn't we tell people we're German? Do you know what would be really interesting to go to right now? An actual ad break. Don't skip over it. Have a listen. See what works. And while you're doing that, hit the follow button on your podcast provider and never miss an episode of How to Be a CEO. That's called a call to action and it's a key performance indicator for a campaign. So please hit the button. Can controversy work for a brand? I mean, I'd imagine a lot of businesses want to stay away from that sort of thing to make a political statement, as Nike have done several times. Is that a good place to be in? It seems very high high risk at times. It depends where the controversy is coming from. If you're doing it with integrity, if you're doing it with fundamental belief, then yes, court controversy if you have to. I mean, I don't think you go out and court controversy for the sake of it. You do it because you're just trying to make a point and it might be upsetting some people, which you most certainly will do. You know, that's the point about a brand. You can't please everyone. You've got to decide who are your core audience, what do they believe in, what do I believe in, how am I leading them? And hopefully you have a, a, a set of beliefs that more and more people want to join into. I mean, but you look at it coming completely unstuck when Pepsi tried to adopt the Black Lives Movement and, and was selling you a Pepsi with somebody pretending that this was all about saving black lives and basically it's a, a can of Pepsi. And that was, you know, had no substance to it, no integrity about it. It was cynical adoption of a, a movement and it came hugely unstuck, uh, quite rightly so too. Patagonia, we've mentioned them already, have got up and said, I'm giving all my company to the shareholders. Now the major shareholder is the earth because we're going to make sure everything we produce doesn't harm the earth. You know, that's going to probably upset some people, you know, because they say, why am I paying for that? And they go, well, fine, and don't, don't buy it. It's a dangerous place then for companies to go, that's doing well. I'm going to try and grab a, a piece of that. Yeah, I think it's really, really cynical. It really upsets me. And I see, I see it in advertising communication all the time where suddenly it's the Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter. All these things yeah. are fundamentally important. But, you know, I, I kind of say, fuck off, you're making toothpaste. <laughs> Make toothpaste in a way which doesn't harm the environment is good for my teeth. I can recycle the tube. Do that. Do your job properly. Uh, don't start, you know, pretending that if I'm using some toothpaste, it's going to make Black Lives Matter better. I mean, it's just it, it's it's lazy marketing. It's just adopt somebody else's cause. Let's have a a little chat about how you got to this position where you're in, sir. John Haggerty. Was there a moment when it kind of all fell into place for you? Was there a breakthrough time? Well, I went to art school. From art school, I went to design school because when I was at art school, I had a very, very good teacher. And Peter said to me, John, you know, I don't think you're going to be the next Picasso, but you love having ideas. You should think about doing graphic design. I went to do graphic design. And whilst I was doing graphic design, I met another wonderful teacher called John Gillard. And we were talking about ideas, and I loved having ideas. I loved the problem of a blank page. And John said, you should be looking at the work coming out of New York. Um, this is like 1964 um, from Dorda and Birnbeck and agencies like that. That's what I think you should be doing, John, not pure graphic design. 
And when he showed it to me, it was like a light bulb moment. And you know, there I was looking at advertising, which I hadn't really thought about before. And it was witty, it was smart, it was clever, but it was also inclusive. That was the brilliant thing about it. And I thought, wow, that's what I want to do. So that, for me, was my light bulb moment. The idea now is the Garage Soho. Can you explain to me what that is, what that project is? Well, the Garage Soho is um, uh, what we call an early stage investment company. It helps um, young businesses get up off the ground, finding them finance, but also giving them guidance. From that, we've now created this new um, uh, idea called the Business of Creativity. And it's a series of lectures I give to large organizations. It's online. It's an online course, getting businesses to understand how to engage with creativity. That was Sir John Hegarty. For more interviews, news and analysis, go to standard.co.uk forward slash business. New episodes of How to Be a CEO drop every Monday morning. So start your week with us. I'll see you then.